Try for wrong. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The moment in which you can do is now. This remains an unyielding fact of life up into the moment in which it is no longer true. When we reach the day with no tomorrow, and the now moment of life is no longer ours, we will no longer be alive. Recently, a man passed away who had the foresight of words, who knew that words had the power to make himself present for a moment in which he would not be present, and so wrote a four-part poem entitled Epitaphs, of which I will read the third. Half moon in the morning, it is night everywhere. On Mars, on Venus, in the depths of the Milky Way. So drink to the night, it is always with us. That is uh, Bill Luddington, PhD alum and retired libra librarian from UC Davis. And unlike the night that is always with us, this moment of now is not. So let us not waste another moment of it by uh, not getting to This Week in Science, which is coming up next. Then yeah. there's music. Oh, good <laughs> evening. <Here's some. laughs> good good okay. evening, Justin. We are really back yet again. You. It's This Week in Science, and it's evening. It's not morning. For those of you who have been following the twists movements through the internets and the radio sphere. We are now live on twit.tv every Monday night from 8 to 9 p.m. If you're listening to us live on the radio, we are no longer amongst the living. Well, just not live. Recorded. Yes. We're pre-recorded. Pre-recorded. We're robot That's voices. Awesome. Ah! <laughs> So today's show, we have a ton of science news, as usual, but we also have a, um, a retraction to make. Last week, Justin reported on a story that a was... Incantation, a, re a correction, oh, oh, if you will. A correction, if you will. So yeah, we're going to eat some crow. True. We, don't, we haven't proven that it's not true. <laughs> Nobody's actually done the study. I, I, I've looked no, in the web. No, there's no study been done. So it's not not true yet. But people who didn't watch or listen last week we'll have no idea what we're talking okay. about so last we're week, gonna have to bring it in hold on study. hold on hold on hold on so we're gonna be doing that we're gonna be giving our recantation um but then we're also going to be getting to the science news as usual and i brought stories about uh nervous nerves and um some some globally changing birds what do you have i've got a uh, warning from uh from hawking's I've got uh, on Earth as it is on Saturn some similarities that uh, may have really big implications uh, coming from a new discovery here on Earth. Uh, there is uh, more stories about dark matter floating around out there in the universe and <laughs> a gene variant that may help us gain weight may also shrink our brain. So that's sort of a, an interesting choice to have to make. And uh, yeah. And some other other stuff that might creep in here. Yeah, I like creepy science. Let's let's talk about lots mm -hmm. of creepy science tonight. Ooh. Okay, so now that we're done with telling you what one. we're going to be covering in today's show, let's get to the retraction. This is this week in science, and we have to talk about real science, right? Yeah, and last week I told about uh, I talked about a study that was done examining the health benefits uh, to men. Uh, if they were uh, spending good amounts of time ogling women's breasts, that it could actually extend the life uh, expectancy by as much as five years. And that uh, apparently uh, was a, it was a story that was sent in to me that I didn't really vet too hard. Um, I, I usually go and seek the direct source of this study, and I didn't find it right away. And I, may, uh, I admit that I may have, may have wanted the story to be true just on the surface, and wasn't uh, wasn't looking to put too critical an eye on, on it. But in fact, it seems the study is an urban legend that uh, is not in any way, shape, or cup size an actual story. So yeah. if we, my apologies to any minions who were slapped in the attempt to live longer, healthier, happier lives. If we can, <laughs> if we can learn one thing from this, though, from this travesty of twist story integrity, it is that the more you want to believe something, the easier it is to believe in it. 
we actually should keep this in mind, uh, not only in the context of something that was as self-indulgently uh, permissive, a pseudoscientific study as this one, but in any perspective that we go through in our days, for uh, all of us every day, probably have a belief or two that is convenience-based. That yeah. uh, if we were really more critical about it, we may we may have to take on a little bit more thinking around it, but uh, things are... If we have the perspective we wish to have, the, it's just it's just easier sometimes. So uh, yeah. special truth and vigilance shout outs. I mean, it's Johan, Mark, uh, Joel or Joel in Sweden uh, for their very timely corrections. And yes, Mark, part of me knew it was too good to be true. The part <laughs> of me that does 90 percent of my thinking. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if anybody is interested out there in looking up, you know, the the hoax, uh, Snope, Snopes dot com, S N O P E S dot com is a great resource for uh, unearthing those internet hoaxes. And uh, I also did a little web search of my own, and I could not find, you know, a paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Karen Weatherby, as was reported in the article. And I actually means couldn't the study find hasn't anything been done yet. I know I couldn't if find a anything in the PubMed database. To the Justin, study, Justin, call me because I'm a totally volunteer. <laughs> yeah, so I have I couldn't find anything online matching such a study in PubMed, and yeah, there is nothing out there. It's so right, somebody totally should bogus. do the study. It's make it up. It's make yeah, me up. The study first surfaced in about uh, 1997. Actually, people said it's been around for five years. It's been around for over. 10 years. It's 1997. A version of this story was first published in the Weekly World News, which we all know is a wonderful, wonderful source for um, pseudoscientific well, information. And that's very interesting because that means actually it could be a real study because most of the online databases that have studies are current. They don't really have, an, the archives aren't really in there yet. So Maybe this was a study that was done that's just in some dusty book somewhere, you know, on some dusty journal on a shelf in a library, but isn't uh, archived online. So maybe there is validity to it. We can always hold out that last strain of hope. We can. We can hold out hope. So, the, you know, there is always hope. You can always, you know, dare to dream that you as a as a man may one day be able to stare at women's breasts guilt free. <laughs> but for now, the data nope. is not in. All you know is how it makes you feel personally. And I'm sure that slap is not going to feel so good. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. I think I think the Internet has allowed men to live longer regardless of, of what they do in public. So, <laughs> yeah, you're, prob you're probably very right there. <laughs> Yeah, but I think you're also right, Justin, in bringing up the point that this is a, a reminder for all of us to just be aware that what we like to believe isn't always true. And Especially critical me. thinking. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. the one that brought the bogus story. <laughs> and critical thinking is something that's very important, and it's great to apply it. It, it pays to be a critical thinker, yet, you know, once again, unfortunately, in this situation, it smashes it smashes your dreams critical thinking <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i'm still holding out hope it just makes too much sense too much too much tell me a story justin oh okay let's see uh on earth as it is on saturn's moon titan so not actually on saturn but on the moon titan there are hydrocarbon seas all over the the this little moon and it is also here on the Earth in sort of a similar type of feature that we, uh, we're familiar with as tar pits, basically is a micro, micro uh, hydrocarbon sea. Um, and hmm. scientists have discovered life in some pools of asphalt uh, that is widening the door on, on the picture where life can actually exist, not just on this planet, which it now seems to be absolutely everywhere. Everywhere, yeah but even further in the universe itself. So the discovery was made at Pitch Lake, which is a poisonous, foul-smelling uh, one of these tar pits on the Caribbean island of Trinidad, Tobago. And reporting in the physics blog, our sieve archive, I guess is what it's sort of, A-R-X-I-V, Dr. Dirk Schultz-Makuch of Washington State University and colleagues found Pitch Lake 
teeming, teeming with microbial life. The Schultz wow. McCook uh, says, despite the lake being filled with hot asphalt and bubbling with noxious hydrocarbon gases and carbon dioxide, it is full of life. And water is also very, obviously, very scarce in the lake, certainly below the levels normally thought of as the threshold for life to exist. Uh, wow. Yet on average, every gram of goo in the lake contains tens of millions of living cells. Wow. Whoa. That's awesome. That's Isn't that's. That? I love hearing stuff like that. The the just every time we go looking places, it just opens the door a little bit further for where life can exist. And the fact that we're finding them in these asphalt tar pits here on our own planet means that on other planets, it's I mean, the the possibility of microbial life existing is incredibly high it's yeah i mean the numbers just got way bigger for forget the earth-like planets we don't need earth-like planets out there anymore for life to exist <laughs> we need titan moon-like planets would suffice so uh yeah. okay so schultz uh, makuch says his analysis of the gene sequences show many different kinds of microbial species of archaea and bacteria so it's not even just that they've found uh, one extremophile that's managed to survive here, it's many different kinds. So then there's the redundancy of of, of this not just being a one-off um, adaptation that's taken place, but multiple an, different species. Yeah, there's an entire ecosystem, an entire environment where different species are probably occupying different niches inside of the ecosystem, playing, fulfilling different roles, maybe creating compounds that other bacteria are able to live off of, or, you know, maybe there's some amount of sharing and helping in the bacterial world in the tar pits. Yeah, uh, apparently uh, similar strange life forms have been previously seen in uh, samples from subsea oil wells, which is way deeply down there, uh, which is another reason that they are of interest. So Schultz uh, Makuk now uh, says that the uh, microbial organisms degrade and process oil reservoirs, or how they did, they process the this oil is very uh, poorly understood. Or is it, so they're living in an oxygen-free environment. It's full of heavy metals, very little water. They're eating hydrocarbons and in some cases breathing out or, you know, breathing out metals. Wow. So it's, it's not really breathing in the way that you go, yeah. you know, and take a breath the way that we take a breath. It's it's respiration in terms of uh, compounds in and compounds out, a turnover of oxygen. Um, and, and there are other byproducts that come out in the process. So in the sense of how we respire, we carbon dioxide is our off gassing. Um, but that's not necessarily the way that all organisms have to do it if they have different different chemical pathways. Yeah, some of these are uh, methanogens, others are thriving on the sulfur, iron, and some of them are just flat out never been seen before. So the this does open up that whole, well, then Titan could have, I mean, the, the entire, all these hydrocarbon seas that we just assume are dead. Just assume that life can't be there. How could it, how um, could it be there? Yeah. How could it be there? And then we find it in abundance, teeming multiple species right here on Earth in a similar similar situation yeah i wonder if you add so titan is also not i mean not just having different compounds less oxygen that kind of stuff more more methane more tar pits i don't know uh but the temperature is going to be extremely different from what's here on our planet so even though it's nice and hot and bubbly here and we're finding them in tar uh maybe that situation is going to be a little bit different on Titan. I mean, but that's not to say sure, that it sure. couldn't happen. I'm just saying that if you're but dealing that's, with but really that's cold. The, yeah, that's all uh, thinking that, uh, but that's, that's origin of life starting on Earth thinking that right. this is the right conditions, that this is the right temperature, that it couldn't be an ice, uh, that life wouldn't survive on an icy meter or floating through space, which now we think it's another one of the possibilities. Right. So yeah, th there's a lot of our preconceptions uh, about where life can live is based on this assumption that it actually started here and that we were the only life. And so anywhere else in this universe for yeah. life to exist has to be just like this, right? Yeah, I love I love that the, all of these ideas of how life has to be, it's just because we're totally self-centered. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, like, I, it's all about us. It's all about us, people. <laughs> and it's and largely because we have nothing to com- like compared to what? Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, until we know, until we know. Um, but there is a word of warning from uh, from physicist Stephen Hawking. Warning. warning. The aliens warning. are coming. <laughs> He's warning people to wash hands after touching alien life forms. And if possible, to avoid contact completely whenever possible. Um, <laughs> his uh, quote here is, if aliens visit us, the outcome would be much as when Columbus landed in America, which didn't turn out well for the Native Americans. So what does Hawkins think of the chances of life in space is? To his, he says, to my mathematical brain, the numbers alone make thinking about aliens perfectly rational. The real challenge is to work out what they might actually be like. It's kind of an interesting analogy, though, too. The uh, he's uh, it didn't turn out well for the Native Americans, but uh, who's to say the aliens don't come down here and then all get the the you know the swine flu? They get taken down like <laughs> immediately, you know? Yeah, don't just don't let right, an alien really? sneeze on you. Really? That you have no? Oh, you've been using the antimicrobial soaps for a thousand years, and that's why either you've knocked them out completely. Y'all, you, oh, you haven't run into a microbe in ten thousand years, really? Wow, that's that's rough. Do you think that would be the case, though? I mean, sure, okay, maybe an advanced life form is you know that much further ahead of us, but would they really have gotten rid of bacteria? I think that would be impossible to do. I think that their medical medical science and technology would advance to a point that it would be just moot that right. you know coming in contact with bacteria or viruses or any of these things that cause us trouble because of our primitive technologies. You know, we have, that, we have they're, they're, they're going to be that far advanced because we're a primitive race. And but I think, mm-hmm. no, I think it's very likely that uh, whoever they are have long since cast out the most species of beneficial bacteria. And the reason for them coming to Earth and doing anal probes <laughs> is basically collecting some gut microflora to take so, back to the mothership so that they can have good digestion again. That would be a, right. that would be a. Totally perfect explanation for, for all these anal probes. They're it's working just, on know, the microbiologists on, on just you know, fixing, the, fixing the system. Getting <laughs> some probiotics on that primitive planet. Uh, oh, my goodness. Well, I'm getting a little nervous here. Or maybe it's not me getting nervous. I, I can stop, stop talking for a few minutes. Today. Yeah, yeah, maybe. No, uh, I have two stories, though, about your nerves and how they get activated. And so I'm going to talk about it for a second. Moving on from life in outer space, killing us. We're just going to talk about how how we work and how our nerves function. Neuroscientists have known for years that nerves are excited, but why when ions, these charged molecular entities like sodium and potassium and calcium and chloride, move from one side of the nerve cell membrane to the other. Uh, Changing the distribution of the ions ends up changing the distribution of charge. And so you actually end up with a a different charge on the membrane. Uh, And so the membrane is normally a barrier to the flow of these ions and keeps the ions separated until the right stimulus comes along, which opens up these little tiny pathways in the membrane that are called ion channels. They open up and then the ions rush across the membrane in the direction that just seems the easiest. It's down there. They're gradient. Um, Path of least resistance. Exactly. Exactly. That's so, how my brain works. <laughs> that's how the nerves get stimulated. <laughs> how is that not surprising to me? And it's not surprising to me either. <laughs> not at all. Um, so neuroscientists through the years have learned a lot about what kind of ion channels are present on various nerves in different areas um, and what makes them tick. So uh, what what stimulates them, what what makes a, what makes a temperature receptor, what temperature causes a temperature receptor to open up, or what voltage causes a chloride channel to open up. Um, but there are lots of questions to be answered, and two studies out this week made a lot of progress toward helping us understand what controls this flux of ions and then ultimately nerve stimulation. One deals with chloride channels and epilepsy, And the other study deals with how the special structure of a temperature receptor ion channel allows you to feel the heat. So the first study, researchers at the Max Planck Institute of Neurobiology investigated chloride ion channels and their relationship to epilepsy. And while this might sound kind of weird, you're like, what do these have to do with each other? 
I'll tell you. When chloride moves out of a nerve cell through the chloride channels, the nerve cell becomes less excitable. It's kind of, you know, lazy, not going to be stimulated. Um, and so the researchers predicted that if a nerve cell lacks chloride channels, it should become easier to stimulate because it should be predictively that it should have more chloride building up inside of it. And so that should change the charge, making it more excitable. Um, so they also predicted from there, if they're easier to stimulate, then the nerves are more excitable, th that individuals without chloride channels should be, and with hyperstimulatable nerves, should be more likely to get epilepsy. So they looked at special mice that were genetically modified to lack a specific chloride channel called the CIC2 channel, and they found that chloride built up in the nerve of these CIC2 lacking mice, just as they predicted. Um, they also found that their nerves were easy to stimulate, just as they predicted. But the mice were not more likely to have ep epileptic seizures. There was no difference between those mice without the chloride channels and other mice with the chloride channels. So they're like, okay, what is going on? And they've come to realize that there's a secondary system of nerves that are inhibitory within the nervous system, that it's their job when their neighboring nerve cells are getting all excited and jumping around to shut them up. So it's kind of like when I kick Justin. <laughs> um, so since all the cells, uh, so basically what they realized is that since all the cells are lacking the chloride channels, the excitable ones and the inhibitory ones, all of them are lacking these chloride channels. Basically, the entire system is more sensitive, but the whole thing is balanced because the excitable ones are more likely to jump and be excited. And so are the inhibitory ones. The so every are just shushing louder. Yeah, shush, exactly. Shush, 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 shush. So <laughs> the whole... Um, keep it down now. <laughs> yeah. Um, Valentin Stein, the leader of the study, says, although the whole system becomes more sensitive, at the end of the day, the balance between the cells is maintained, which is what we like. So the chloride channels are not the culprits behind epilepsy as previously thought. But since this since what are you doing? Huh? Are you doing something? What do you mean? I'm hearing, is I'm it picking it. my nose? I'm hearing a <laughs> ticking sound. Oh, sorry. Didn't think you could hear that. We don't hear it here. It's not coming through here. Maybe Is that getting on your system. nerves? Slightly. <laughs> <laughs> Repetitive tapping sound. All right. Anyway, um, what the researchers then went on to say is, that uh, so the chloride channels are not the culprits behind epilepsy as previously thought. Since the system is sensitive, it might tip the balance when other factors are involved. Uh, Valentin says, we reckon, however, that we've come across something even more exciting. The neurobiologist is referring to the discovery that nerve cells can theoretically use the CIC2 channels to influence their own excitability. If a nerve cell can control its own excitability by opening or closing its CIC2 channels, then it could basically have a say in whether or not it transmits information to its neighbor. So there's some really interesting, uh, interesting stuff in there, I think. Yeah. Um, moving on, the second study looked at the temperature receptor called looked at a looked at a temperature receptor called TRPV1 to discover how it could be affected by temperatures. And after scanning this, they they looked genetically at the receptor to see what it, the amino acids that it was made up of. And then after scanning for all the possible single nucleotide, nucleotide mutations, took like taking out amino acids and putting a bad amino acid back into each spot in the in the protein they basically looked for mutations in the proteins that would only change the temperature sensitivity of the channels but would not affect any of its other mechanisms the researcher says we were looking for single point mutations changes of a single amino acid where the channel still functioned normally in response to capsaicin which is the active ingredient in chili pepper, peppers or ph but not to temperature so Temperature receptors are very receptive to uh, chemical stimulation as well as heat stimulation. So heat, cold, um, capsaicin, which is a chemical, or pH, like acidity. So vinegar can make, uh, or um, 
I don't know, highly acidic stuff. Some highly acidic things can make uh, make these temperature receptors active, but that's not the temperature function. So they basically wanted to see what mutations only affected the temperature ability of this of this receptor. And they found that if they they found a very few mutations that were only located on the outside of the membrane within the receptor. And in that area, they call that this is an area that they call the temperature sensor domain. And so when temperatures are high enough, which is about 108 degrees in the case of this receptor, the temperature sensor domain opens for about 10 milliseconds. And that's long enough for ions to rush through the channel and stimulate the nerve to fire and tell the body that, damn, it's hot. So the study ends up suggesting a potential molecular mechanism by finding these mutations that actually affect how that the receptor works and why it's built the way that it is. And so the receptor, receptor, not the receptor, the researcher says, we now have a novel working model of how nature could have evolved such exquisite temperature sensitivity, a hypothesis that can be tested in future work. Which is good for us. You know, all this temperature stuff is good because if we didn't have it, we would burn our hands. On, on the hands and stuff, stuff, sure, but on the tongue? Or is the tongue not part of it? No, no the I mean, that's the, like you, have, the... you have temperature temperature receptors all over the place. Yeah. That's so if, you're, if you get me. like if you get like a hot latte from Starbucks or something that's right. you know, they've made it or you know, from McDonald's. <laughs> something okay, that's but, too hot and you burn your mouth and you want to spit it out. Wouldn't it be the other kind of... way? Wouldn't it be the wouldn't it be the like the the acidity receptors that are being converted into temperature receptors, not the other way around? Because I can't imagine evolutionarily needing a sensor on my tongue that told me when it was 108 degrees. <laughs> that I was you know what I mean? Like it just you doesn't know. it doesn't make sense. Like it wasn't hot like food. we had hot yeah, food but, is yeah, definitely over. Is, how long have we had hot food, Kirsten? How long have we been burning our tongues with hot food? What if you're going to not... sip? What if you're trying to sip out of that hot hot tar lake, the bubbling tar lake? I, but I mean, <laughs> how often did that come up? This is what I'm saying. It seems really bizarre to me that we would have temperature receptors in the tongue, unless they. Unless that we maybe there was more acidic foods or more other stuff out there that we were actually trying to avoid evolutionarily. Right. right. But, so um, so hot food, things like, like capsaicin uh, containing foods or food that's um, very acidic that is going to damage your digestive tract in some way. Um, if you have that molecule already in place, so the protein to detect that, and then it's just a, a, sing, a simple segment of the code of the like a, a few inserts of amino acids just kind of shoved in there that happen to respond to temperature as well. It's not a, a far fetched idea, you know, that maybe there, there was an insertion at some point in time that, you know, allowed these temperature receptors to become multimodal or to have more functioning. I don't know. Can you burn your know. tongue? Can you burn your tongue right below 108 degrees? I, don't know. I, I think I think the temperature thing must just be a recent affair. That's what we're calling it. But I don't. I, it just doesn't make sense to me that it would have anything that uh, biologically an, there would be any use for it whatsoever. That's a really Very interesting little, point because how yeah, yeah how long have we been uh, cooking food? Somebody says in the chat room we've had food that we've been cooking for about 150,000 years at yeah, least. Yeah, just like a, just briefly, so. just just very recently. Yeah, and, and but but we're not the only ones who can sense heat. So it's but it's not necessarily that it needs to be on your tongue. These receptors are all over your body, so you don't want to burn your hand by putting it in, you know, hot scalding water. You don't want to freeze yourself by standing out in the snow too long. Um so these receptors have to are there all over your body and they just happen to be on your tongue as well. And so this even, one receptor just happens to respond to sense. over a hundred. <laughs> doesn't make a lot. You don't think so? Well, I guess. I guess. Why not just put them anywhere? Why not just put them anywhere? Once you're damaging nerves or something, I guess they should scream out and say, "Stop! That's too much." But they call them a heat sensor because even I'm just even thinking like in the forest or the prairie or the cave <laughs> or wherever we supposedly come from. That's not actually my tongue, and the photo that they brought up on the. This is video <laughs> version of the show, <laughs> but it just doesn't really make sense to me that even that it would be specifically for for high temperatures. I don't see where just most animals in general, most wildlife encounters really high temperature uh, anything, except for maybe the right. occasional rock. Like 
Right. Really does, you know, even then. Uh-huh. It's just weird. I think I think it's interesting. I think, you know, the the ability of this of 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 these proteins, these receptor proteins that are these ion channels that they've become so specific to particular things, um, you know, that these these receptors can respond to uh, particular changes in chloride ions uh, in the environment that they can respond to pH or a chemical or a temperature and like that, that, that this has come about as the result of it's like adding pieces to a puzzle you know that the originally the puzzle was really small and he just kept adding pieces to it and suddenly the it, the puzzle keeps making sense but you don't know really how it makes sense because you're just adding all these new pieces yeah I think it's pretty cool. I think, um, you know, this research looking into how our nerves conduct information, what stimulates them, what doesn't, how it gets going. I mean, it's all going into the question of how we work, who we are, what stimulates you? Ah, mm. I, don't, I don't know. I bet you talk <laughs> about it on the radio. But uh, I will go uh, take a few moment break. Uh, everybody can take a moment, a few moments to self-stimulate. As we go to our our, our mid show break here, and yeah. we'll be back in just a few moments with more this week in science. Pretend I have got this. Go away, pretend uh, yeah, go. I've got this crazy clicking from my end, and I don't know what's going on when I talk. It's like somebody's going like. Scott Wilkinson had that problem earlier today uh, on yeah. the Skype channel. Let me try disconnecting and calling you back real quick. Okay, that would be great. Cool, thank you. Bye, I'll be back in a second. Entertain us, Justin. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a your song. job. <clears throat> <clears throat> Fly me to the moon. Let me dance among the stars. I want to see what spring is like gone. Jupiter and Mars. In wow, other words, it's like elevator music. That's awesome. <laughs> neighbors banging on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> clack, 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 clack. Oh, thank you so much, John. The, the, the in- it may come back. Um, it came back for Scott. So try. We're not hearing it on this end, so it's not in the recording. So if you can endure it. Yeah, well, that's what I was trying to do until we got to the break. So hopefully I'll be able to sure, I'll make it through. A, a, color camera too hmm? your colors are kind of faded your colors are oversaturated i think yeah <laughs> the crystal looks great it removes wrinkles you saw that is that the secret I, a, actually a 90 year old man it's not uh, even a good rug this isn't even this isn't even <laughs> close to wouldn't pass in, in the in daylight nah wouldn't pass all right you ready to start again Go for it. Okay. And we're back with more This Week in Science after a break in which we were gone. We are back. This is This Week in Science. I am Dr. Kiki Sanford, and I'm with Justin Jackson for about another 27 minutes or so, 25 minutes, something like that. And we have much more science news for you in the rest of this hour. Um, can I talk about, or you want to, I want to hear a story from you, Justin. I talked a lot last hour. Really? Because I've only got uh, these two stories left. Uh, okay, I don't here we believe go. you, but that's okay. <laughs> this is uh, via the space.com, and uh, this is the elusive dark matter has been uh, is found clustering around galaxies and clumping into cigar shapes, according to most recent observations. The discovery could help scientists finally, no, not finally, finally understand what makes up dark matter which is the mystifying stuff thought to exist invisibly all around us. Uh, Dark matter, which could be more than five times more abundant than visible matter, I've actually heard numbers as as high as 50 times, uh, is only detectable through its gravitational pull on regular matter. And when they're saying detectable through uh, gravitational pull on regular matter, they're also looking at the speed at which uh, galaxies are spinning Uh, only makes sense uh, and the effects of galaxies moving through the universe only make sense with all this uh, what they're considering to require additional mass uh, that would be coming from this dark matter and by dark matter they mean matter that's not visible to us 
not through the light spectrum, not through any other means that we do know of uh, detecting it. And there's a quote here. There are clear theoretical predictions that we expect dark matter halos to be flattened like this, says study co-author Graham P. Smith, one of the UK University of Birmingham. Uh, he says it's very beautiful, very clean and direct measurement of that that they've, they've got going here. Smith and the team led by... Uh, Masame Aguri of the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan and uh, Masahiro uh, Takada of the University of Tokyo used a quirk of gravity called the gravitational lensing to observe dark matter's gravitational effects on a large collection of galaxies, a cluster where there's just a whole bunch in one, one visible area. Gravitational lensing occurs, so you've got light coming from behind a large object, and because it's warping space, it sort of does this this curvature around it, and it causes light to travel along that curved path when it goes by. And the amount of this curvature can tell astronomers how massive the celestial object is. So you've right. got, you can tell sort of even if you can't see this object here. Say this this my fist was invisible. This object in the foreground is invisible. Um, by the amount of lensing of galaxies behind it, stars behind it even, uh, you can tell how much mass is in, in the foreground. Right. It, because of the, having more mass causes it to bend space more. Right. Right? Correct. So for the study, the uh, researchers used the prime focus camera on the Subaru telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii to observe 20 galaxy clusters. They took advantage of gravitational lensing to create maps of this distribution of mass around the clusters. And this is how they formed a, their sneak peek at the, uh, the secret dark matter. And what, what we're probing with these gravitational lensing observations is the dark matter distribution because dark matter dominates the mass on these large scales. Hmm. And uh, computer simulations based on the theory have predicted such shapes, but they have never been uh, before been verified in the actual universe and to such an extent with so many large clusters. Hmm. So yeah, they're that... hoping this is going to come up with, uh, yeah, help them pin down a little better what, uh, what exactly is going on with the dark matter. But... Yeah, I, I, the thing to me that's it just is mind boggling is that we're studying dark matter, but it's all by proxy. We can't see it. We don't know what it's made up of. We've got these mm -hmm. guesses and we're trying, we're just like, it's like, it's like one of those Halloween haunted houses where you like stick your hand in the bowls, but you can't see what you're sticking your hand on. And it's like the peeled grapes feel like eyeballs, but they're grapes. And so you're, we're just, that's the stage that we're, we're at right now. We've got these telescopes that are looking at the bending of light. So we're getting an idea of the shape of things and how much mass this dark matter might be really taking, taking account of. But I mean, we're still, we have no idea. And no dark clue. matter is just a, a just a placeholder. Um, they're going to have to give right. it a better name later on once they have a different dark born in which to investigate. But can, yeah. can you sort of imagine that uh, dark matter today, as fascinating as it is, and as much as we're starting to learn about it, um, you could sort of apply this to like three, four hundred years ago, thinking of trying to conceive of how magnets work, how that mysterious right. unseen connection works before we had any understanding of magnetism. Simple magnets must have seemed a very fascinating, very supernatural sort of uh, magic. Yeah. So. Yeah. Even yeah, though it's it, currently unseen, once something becomes understood, th then we uh, yeah. conceive of that we see it, even though we still have to translate it into some sort of visual medium. Yeah, like I, wonder, I, I just wonder. Instance. Yeah, I wonder what it will end up being. You know, that is that I love kind of questioning what it's going to be, what it's going to be made up of, what is the name, the future name for dark matter? What are we going to call it? I don't think it's going to be a stuff. That's still my prediction. That it's you don't not going to be. A you think it's an effect? No. Just an effect. I think. I think it's. I think it's going to be uh, an effect of of mass itself and its interaction with space. I think it's. I think we still have to figure out what space is. I think that's going to be the really fascinating. Space yeah, well, to me, the dimension of space is actually the the eight hundred pound unanswered question in the room, which could be a gorilla or 
an elephant. Or yeah, well, else. wasn't there? A, we we reported recently. There's a Dutch physicist, a theoretical physicist, who's actually come out with an idea, which is around like basically what you're saying. But he's um, saying that space is a an effect as well. So every it's basically taking a different perspective on the problem and so in doing that it ends up working right. out exactly um what gravity is and dark matter and it kind of goes through the gets through the whole issue and, and, and to get historical on that too, quick, on. Yeah. if you if you look at uh if you look at all the amazing deities uh, that the greeks had that the, the norse had that they had throughout the early civilizations across this planet they had gods of each wind and of, of gods of overlooking sheep and gods of water and sea and rain and whatever you could imagine, whatever's out there in nature, there was an entire God, even the passions, love and war and these, you know, all these things had entire gods who were in charge of them, but there was no God of gravity. Yep. It didn't exist. And there was no, no God like holding your feet to the ground. No, it just didn't exist because there was no point at which where we suddenly just didn't have gravity. Like the wind came from the north once and the west once. So those were those were comings and goings and conflictings and was dark and light. So you needed the dark God and the light God. But because gravity is a constant down here on planet Earth, we kind of don't notice it. And, and I think the same thing is, can be said of our perspective of, of exploring the universe without having conceived that space, because it can seem like such a constant everywhere we're looking, um, could, be, could be a force unto itself that we're in the midst of. And I think that's a fascinating idea. That it's, it's our perspective of how we, how we start to notice things and the, 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 the chain that we conceive that sort of sometimes limits us. And of course, it could be completely... Uh, not there could be no such thing as space too. <laughs> it might not I think exist. it's an effective. I think it's an effective time. Oh look, we're melding. Ooh. Video yeah. effects. I know it's pretty crazy. <laughs> um, speaking of effects that you see, <clears throat> excuse me, but you effects you see and then don't really know exactly how they're going to turn out. Um, the effects of climate change on birds. Migratory birds, especially, has been something that people have been really concerned about because what's going to happen to the poor birds when their migrating grounds, the place they're going to go to for summer breeding, suddenly is still covered with snow when they arrive and there's no food for their for themselves or their babies. It's problem problemville, right? right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Researchers Francisco Polito and Peter Berthold, they're at the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology. They've recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, a study that has taken uh, years and years for them to actually uh, put out. They re they got birds from, I think, between 1988 and 2001. They, uh, they took black cap Black caps are a European bird. Uh, black cap warblers, I believe. Um, they took nestlings from their nests every year for a total of 757 birds in the laboratory that they got. They reared them all by hand so they didn't have, um, you know, their, their mother or father bird. It was no effect of other birds rearing them. And then they were put in a situation where the light was modulated and given different uh, different amounts of light during the daytime, during the nighttime. Um, and so it was, they shifted the light uh, in such a way that it should affect the bird's migration activity. Um, birds naturally respond to daylight cycles and that certain, the shortening of daylight uh, in the fall actually triggers some species of birds that migrate to start putting on fat and to get ready to to fly away. And birds actually start doing this flying, fluttering behavior. If you have them in the laboratory and you, they don't have anywhere to go, they'll basically like f just flutter in their cage and try and go. They'll they'll pick a direction and try and fly, but they won't be able to get there. Um, and I think even here in the San Francisco Zoo, every spring, you'll see the the penguins will just start swimming around and around and around and around their, their enclosure because they just don't, they, they would be swimming somewhere normally in the wild, but they don't have anywhere to go. Um, wow. Yeah. So, so what they, what they did is they, they wanted to, to look in, at, at this behavior of migration and find out exactly how different factors affected it. And if those factors affected the actual genetics and so if this if the shifting of um, of migratory 
paths and cycles was actually something that was a process of evolution taking place. And so uh, so right now in the wild, they're finding that black caps are returning to their breeding sites earlier. They're laying their eggs earlier and then they're leaving later in the autumn. So uh, not they're not tied to the daylight cycles the same way that they used to be. There's like a two week there. There's a two week difference in what they used to do to what they do now. Um, and so the researchers said, OK, what are the mechanisms for global warming? Are there measurable changes in migratory behavior uh, that that go along with a temperature increase? And then do they reduce migratory distance? And it's been shown that long distance migrant migrant birds will actually start um, decreasing the distance that they migrate as well. So instead of flying a thousand kilometer, kilometers, they're going to start flying, say, 500 because, hey, I'm going to stop here. It looks pretty nice as opposed to continuing on and not necessarily finding what they need. So there's a, a plasticity in the, in the behavior that they've got. Um, so the birds that they that they took out, they um, they they basically found that the birds taken during the 14 years showed a significant reduction in their migratory activity. So with the changes in light that they were given in the laboratory, uh, the birds actually decreased the distance or the equivalent distance that they would have flown in the wild. And then they looked at the population to see if it was a genetic component. And they actually proved that, yeah, from generation to generation of birds that were in the were raised in the laboratory and stayed in the lab, there were genetic changes taking place that were related to the migratory activity. Finally, they looked at uh, they took birds out in the wild and they found uh, birds with the least migratory activity and then their offspring. And so they and they paired these birds over four generations. So kind of trying to um, to manage the birds into less and less migratory activity through selective breeding, the way that like breeders look for like sh try and get short haired cats or whatever. It's just like, oh, we want a less migrating bird. Um, and so they paired these lines. And then after two generations they found their first resident birds, which means that the birds completely stopped migrating. And so uh, what they're saying here, uh, Francisco Pulido says, we assume that the reduction in migration distance is the first and most significant evolutionary mechanism that migratory birds have adapted, uh, have for adapting to change climatic conditions. And for birds that migrate short to average distances of approximately, approximately 1,000 kilometers, and in which migratory behavior is genetically determined, as is the case with most ah, cell birds, this can be a successful strategy for survival. However, for long distance migrants, for which successful migration is going to depend on overcoming ecological barriers like the ocean or the giant desert, uh, this mechanism of adaptation probably won't work. And a reduction of migration distance would mean spending the winter in a hostile environment, which they cannot survive. So basically what they're saying Until here global is... global warming makes that hostile environment nice, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Until it makes it nice. Um, but kind of what they're saying is that these shorter distance migrants might do better in terms of adapting to climate change because they have this plastic response where they're, oh, I'll just stop here instead of continuing the whole direction, as opposed to long distance migrants like, uh, I don't know, the albatross or something that's going to fly thousands and thousands and thousands of miles um, or, or some, uh, some, some hawk species, uh, you're going to find a very, very difficult ability in those birds to be able to adapt to the changes. And so maybe it's the long distance migrants that we need to be looking at in terms of conservation efforts as climate change starts happening. I don't know. What do you think? Um, yeah, I see. I think I've seen the <laughs> largest. I think they're just posseing up, traveling lar larger packs. I saw the largest uh, grouping of geese flying uh flying north that i think i've ever ever seen it was uh it was an amazing it was it, they like filled the sky it was pretty bright i love birds yeah. i do i love birds yeah any I, I, I don't know it's a good it's what I are think those it's like, what are those little black stuff. with the red are they thrushes what are they that around here have you, you, have you seen them they're little yeah. little blackbirds 
but they've got like these really red uh, breasts, I guess. Usually those would be um a thrush red something. It's not a it's not a thrush. It's a I'm complete <laughs> completely blanking on it here read the story read your next story and i'll figure it out yeah, i know, know exactly what you're they're all over i know what you're they're talking about right now right, and right. they sing the males get up and they're like la, 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 and they have their pretty songs yeah red-breasted blackbirds probably somebody mm, says no it's got some other name i don't know what it is yeah. that's too why easy, am though. i like completely failing at this right now i'm like Bleh. and put you yeah. on the spot no that's not it. what is that there's putting up a picture of like a toucan Small too. <laughs> it's like, it's like that, a, except that it's like an Oriole or a speak or something. Uh, gene variant that uh, helps us gain weight may shrink our brains as well. <laughs> ah! Rather be skinny than <laughs> smart. Elderly uh, <laughs> obese people who are uh, are more likely to develop dementia, and their brains tend to be smaller than those of people of, uh, with normal weight. This has commonly been attributed to. Um, artery clogging that is slowing blood flow to the brain so that the idea is that neurons are dying off because less blood flow is getting to the brain because for some reason it's assumed that obese people have more clogged arteries but now paul thompson <laughs> team at the university of california los angeles has found that a gene variant linked to obesity may harm the brain directly Half of Europeans and West Africans have a variant of gene called FTO that increases the risk of obesity by two thirds. The, the variant is thought to affect metabolism as well as fat storage. So when Thompson's team looked at the brain scans of 206 healthy people aged 70 to 80, they found that those with at least one copy of the FTO variant had 8% less volume in their frontal lobes, 12% less in the occipital lobes and compared with their counterparts who were lacking this variant. Uh, the brains of those with the variant looked 16 years older by some sort of subjective test that wasn't explained here. Whoa. The, the FTO variant could be damaging to the brain indirectly by helping uh, to make people fatter, but Thompson reckons it plays a more direct role too as the FTO is expressed in high levels in the brain. So, so, perhaps... For all of our society's um, super uh, shallow obsession with the skinny, you know, supermodel body form, maybe there's an evolutionary push behind this. Maybe some part of us recognizes that there's perhaps a less of a propensity to have something that is um, going to have uh, going to in increase the or decrease the size of the brain in, in the information age. That's becoming more and more important to have a a brain that has as much room as possible. Mm. What if we're not being shallow? What if that's just natural selection? Now it's kind of creepy. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna ruminate back here for a moment. Mm, ruminate uh, and eat something. Well, this is the thing. It's because our brains keep making us do things that we're completely unaware that it's making us do. Have you noticed? I don't think your brain is making... Well, yeah, your there's also all the subconscious stuff, that the chemical stuff that goes on that it doesn't really... Yeah, it's not something you're telling yourself you want to do. It's not on the conscious level. There's, yeah, there's underlying stuff going on. Um, I have a study that ties into with what you're talking about here pretty well. Uh, just published uh, through the... Uh, who is it? The NIH. Some scientists from the NIH... Uh, researching at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism have published in PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that yeah. they have found genes that influence your brainwave patterns. So they've mm -hmm. actually linked particular genes to, say, your theta rhythm or your alpha rhythm. Uh, and, not, and not necessarily yours per se, Justin, but they've... Um, They've, they looked at a, a population of Native Americans who have uh, alcoholism prevalent in their, in their society, uh, in their population. And basically, they looked at different genes that could potentially underlie variation in the brain. And they found that there was one, uh, one gene that accounted for 9% of uh, an EEG or the electroencephalograph, which is the uh, when you have electrodes on the outside of your skull that record the summed 
activity of your brain, uh, of the theta theta wave variability, variability that was seen in the Native American sample. And then they also found in looking at non or at North American whites, they found that the same gene accounted for about 4% instead of the 9%. So it's decreased. And they think it's because there's increased variability within the uh, North American white population compared to the Native American population. Um, huh. Yeah, but they also think that there's a pos- they, they found that there was a link for one of the genes as well uh, that was in, in, involved in prevalence for alcoholism. So it turns out your theta wave or the slow wave activation of your brain is influence changed or it in, is influenced is different if you're an alcoholic. And so they've actually potentially linked a gene with what your slow wave will be like and thus whether or not you're likely to be an alcoholic. So you could actually strap this on apparently at any age. Right? Any yeah, that's what you would think. And that's what I wonder is like does I wonder if anybody's done the study to look at changes in brainwave activity throughout life and through experiences. And so, you know, maybe you genetically have a predisposition for alcoholism. Well, we know there is. We know but, there, the, the gene. But we're, yeah. So, yeah. So then, I mean, if it's uh, if it's combined, if we're genetically predisposed to alcoholism, is that uh, is that genetic predis that is, can that be discovered by monitoring the brainwaves? Right. So we do the EKG and say, okay, the waves look like this. He's probably got this set of genes <laughs> without having to look any deeper, right? Right. Without yeah. having, without having, just look at the activation of the brain and know pop, pro, with high probability what genes are there in to, from the get-go. I mean, that's kind of a weird indirect measurement, don't you think? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, mm-hmm. And the, but and, and thinking about how easy it is to record brain activity and possibly to make make assumptions or even decisions about certain people um you know there's a there's there's a lot of p- potential risk for bio uh, bioethics here like um treating people differently because they have you know a certain yeah, yeah but when when you're <laughs> Kirsten, if you and I ever get to the position where somebody's going to be checking us out for our next job based on our EKGs or whatever, I mean that job uh, we we probably aren't going out for that job. <laughs> it's it's going to be such an important like we can only find, we only want somebody with the right EKGs, with the right DNA, with the right family. There's a certain point where eh, it's, I don't think it'll ever come to to that being a, a de- defining. A way of defining people. Yeah, I, I, I hope not. But it's an interesting unless, development, unless, nonetheless. Unless, unless, um, it's beneficial to the position. Then it makes sense. Because then, in a way, if, uh, uh, for instance, might be a, if you went and found, uh, found a good test that uh, could separate the super taskers, those people mm-hmm. who can multitask without being deficient in other, you know, the other tasks that they're doing. They can, they can text and drive. While taking a phone call, on the other hand, you know, they can do it all at the same time, no problem. Maybe we want to be doing these tests to seek out these people to push them into, like, air traffic control. Certain roles. Right. Right. Yeah. And then if they don't want to do that for a living, force them. Yeah. Hey, I think we're out of time. So I'm going to give I have a couple of quick, uh, quick updates here for everybody. Uh, Japan's Hayabusa probe is returning to Earth in June. Hayabusa. Hayabusa. Gonna go visit I, know. I know it's so exciting it's going to land in the outback of australia so around june we're going to probably be having a high i think we should have a hayabusa party don't you think yeah celebration for hayabusa's return the little the little um probe that it could brought any, it the cow with it <laughs> that's right see if it brought back any comet so exciting. Um, also, this week marks the She's an Astronomer Conference in England. It's a conference for women astronomers. Enough said. And additionally, I believe this weekend, May 2nd, uh, I didn't put it in my notes, unfortunately, so I don't have all the details, is the California Cognitive Sciences Conference. I will put the link um, in our show notes on our website, twist.org. Uh, but basically, it's at Berkeley, UC Berkeley in the Bay Area. 
Saturday, May 2nd. And there are going to be a lot of really interesting cognitive brain science things going on, lectures and event, uh, interactive events and stuff like that. If I'm not mistaken, uh, I think Whole Earth is that same weekend, isn't it? Or is that the next one? I have no idea. Whole Earth Festival in Davis. Well, it used to be, it used to be one of these things where they would have uh, – all these demonstrations on on green uh, green power, solar panels, and all the future of green technology. Right. You could go sign up at a booth, and you could sign up to go to Africa and, and help fight off poachers uh, who yeah, were trying to kill crunchy. elephants. And, and now it's now it's like a bunch of merchants. <laughs> bunch, <laughs> a bunch of merchants. Merchants, merchants who think they're hippies. I don't know. They're what not they're... even trying anymore. They're not even trying to be hippies. There. They're selling <laughs> like satellite radios at the whole Earth Festival. Yeah. Um, so on next week's show, we have more science lined up. And next week, already, I can't believe it, it's going to be time for a new book of the month. So uh, I'll be letting you know if you check twist, uh, twistbookclub.ning.com, you'll, there's an event listing there for the May book of the month. And I just have to say, aren't you done with Paul Halpern's Collider yet? You should be. Is that uh, shout out. Book? Yeah, Collider was assassinated. I was reading the wrong one. Again. Oh. Again. Yeah. Uh, thanks to Ed Dyer for so many great story suggestions this week. I couldn't have done it without you. Thanks and uh, shout out to all the critical thinkers out there. Absolutely. Oh, and, uh, and we'll be back uh, next week at two different times. One is right here at this time that you, you've been watching and uh, also at a time when you've been listening. At the same time in the next week. I <laughs> don't do that part. I don't even know yet. But uh, <laughs> you can check us out on the web. We're at www.twist.org. You can uh, click on a link there to subscribe to the podcast, which you can take with you and listen anywhere, which if you've already listened to this, you, that's probably already how you've listened to it, unless you watched it live, in which case I don't know why you'd want to listen to it again later. And uh, you can you can email us at uh, Kirsten at This Week in Science, Justin at Sorry. This Week in Science, You've got to put twists somewhere in that uh, in the subject line. Otherwise, you will get spam filtered into, into oblivion. oblivion. That's right. And we do love your feedback. So if you have a topic suggestion or any see any fun, interesting, sciencey goodness out there, uh, let us know. Send us an email. We'd love to see it. And again, we will be back here next week. And we hope that you will join us again for more great science news. Yeah, but if you learned anything from this week's episode, remember. It's all in your head. Woohoo! Oh, and I forgot show. to say, thank you. Everyone else who's listening right now, who this is not going to be in the podcast, probably we'll edit it. But uh, yeah, Twitter, Dr. Kiki or Jackson Fly. I love this. I love this shot I've got right here. It's like it does look like it's a, a old seventies Polaroid, like attempt at early, or maybe even earlier than seventies, like sixties color photo with yeah. the Polaroid, like an instant because it's it is. It's like bleeding everywhere. That's that's rad. <laughs> it is pretty good. You, I know you've been looking for just the right artistic touch and the you know. I think this is it. It's got to right be here. something good, different, and special. I know. You're, you're a believer, creator. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thanks a lot, John. Uh, pleasure as always. Yeah. Awesomeness. Anything awesome. else we need to record tonight? Mm, I don't think there's anything else we need to record. Oh, another piece of news that I didn't get out in the story in the, in the show that's pretty cool. Uh, if there are any scientists out there, take a look at nature.com news. There's a a story by Kevin Lewis from Texas State University. Basically, uh, they found that a lot of the test tubes people are using these days to do experiments are actually leaching chemicals or leach, leaching compounds into the stuff that they're taking, doing experiments on and affecting the results of the experiments and changing the results of the experiments. Is it like a bisphenol A thing or? It's kind of similar. Yeah. Um, so what this says here, uh, the leaching of chemicals out of polypropylene tubes consistently resulted in an overestimation of measurements. Um, and they, they looked at 10 types of tubes from nine manufacturers, used mass spectrometry to determine the levels of leached chemicals 
Um, and they found that when tubes were heated above 37 degrees Celsius and when inorganic solvents were used, both of these are procedures in enzyme catalyzed reactions, protein extractions, and the polymerase chain reaction, which is all stuff that people are doing all the all the time to look at um, DNA and proteins um, that basically they're they're getting screwed. Uh <laughs> <laughs> that would be the uh, sciencey terminology. There. That would be the yeah. that would be the sciencey term. That, so if you're a scientist, talk. yeah, lab that, talk. That's right. I'd be. <laughs> yeah, glass. People in the in the chat room are asking if glass is too expensive. It is, and that's part of the thing is people aren't investing in glass anymore because it's expensive. The plastic test tubes are also easy to throw away after you're done. You don't have to worry about cleaning up your mess. You just throw it into a bio biohazard bag and it goes away to get incinerated. Um, yeah, so there are, you know, lab, there are reasons people use these things in laboratories. But I think it's just interesting that it's just we keep looking at plastics and plastics keep doing stuff like leaching stuff into. It's fascinating. I don't know. I saw a commercial on TV the other day. It said plastic was awesome. So <laughs> I'm all for plastic. No, they are. They're running like the you know industry commercials right now. I, maybe it's maybe it's because of the bisphenol A thing. I don't really. They I don't tried. know why. Maybe yeah, it's they... maybe it's just a sort of general lobbying so that we all of a sudden don't all turn on plastic. <laughs> plastic has for a long time been an excellent one word career advice. <laughs> Plastics. Plastics. Exactly. What should I do with my life? Plastics. <laughs> You're so right, John. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that, I just wanted to get that one out there because I think it's fascinating. I don't think there's anything else that we need. Um, this was a pretty good show. I don't think I'm going to have to edit too much out of it, so that's good. Um, once, yeah, once again, a great show. And I, yeah, I once again, I'm completely surprised. This one, <laughs> this one was, this one was better. I'm really glad that your video looked better. <laughs> yeah. We're getting yeah. there. I, We're getting there. It's turning into a real show. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. It's great. And all um, these interesting topics. I love oh, it. it's got all this expectation then. And then it's like, we're going to have to be like, make it a good show every week. I mean, we got lucky this week, folks. At least I did. Question is, how are you going Justin to get closer lucky. to the camera next week? Every week you've gotten closer to the camera. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know Pretty soon I, we're I just going to be looking at your one. nostril. <laughs> I don't know if this one can focus this close up, but we'll... Or we'll we, we, could do a, we could do a show from our own perspective. You know? What do you mean like, from our own perspective? Like instead of instead of having the camera on us, we could put the camera like a uh, let's see here. Are you there, gonna make an infinite go. loop? Well, see, now can we do that? Because yeah, I guess if I'm looking at the, if I'm looking at you. Yeah, you're ah, creating an infinite loop. There you go. I'm creating an infinite loop. That's infinity taking place. Hilbert Space says that can actually go on infinitum forever and actually never has an end. Although I'm sure it's. It's limited to the resolution of the screen somewhere. But where did you? Oh, did you do it too? Where did you go? Oh yeah, you're down in well, the. I'm 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 in the corner. Okay, <laughs> I'm just, just hiding in the corner. So if we, yeah, all. if we do a whole show from our own perspective, what would? What would? Can you turn yours around, or you're not? You can't play too, can you? No, it's. Because what if I did an infinite perspective of your infinite perspective? Would that be infinite perspective times two or plus one? <laughs> <laughs> I think the streams would cross. No, no, don't no, cross no, the don't streams. Cross the streams. No. No, it ends badly. <laughs> it all ended up okay in the end. It did. They crossed the streams and everything was fine. I think this is my perspective, actually. This is <laughs> Is that how is that how you see the world always, this is how Justin? I see the world always. For all because I, it, when I was a kid, whole earth was uh different. <laughs> All <laughs> Earth Festival really was like uh, not as commercialized as I can't. I can't even talk. I have kids now, so I have to pretend that I didn't have a child, a teenage uh, youth. No, yeah, I was you never were, young. You never, never. I was never young. Don't believe mm -hmm. me. Yeah, um, I can't think of anything else. 
you don't think that you, you broke should... your your infinite loop broke my brain, Justin. <laughs> if you don't if you if you don't think you should not speak. This is this is a quote from the Mad Hatter from the actual Alice in Wonderland book. I think you it's should not time. because you should not be able to. <laughs> exactly, which is one of those things. It's one of the meaningless words. We're going to take a whole tangent here, but it's meaningless word is when people say I don't think or even I think. When they preface that what they're about to say with, I, I, think, I think, I don't think. Just, <laughs> I'm like, I'm glad you bothered to before speaking this time. It's, a, it's uh, also when people say, well, you know, to be honest with you, as obviously that means they've been lying to me up until the point in which they said to be honest with me. Everything else is a lie, then, right? It's all a lie. It's all a lie. Uh, somebody wants to know the name of my cat. Snack. Yummy. That's the name of my cat. She was this cute little tiny snack-sized ball of fur when I got her as a kitten. And now she looks like she ate the entire refrigerator during a midnight snack. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. It just changed. Yeah. It's all perspective. (laughs) 